Hi, everybody. Sorry about those technical difficulties. Uh, good morning. Thank you for attending OSS's Health First Workers Compensation Webinar. We're happy to have you all join us. I'm Dr. Jim Snyder. I'm a fellow here at OSS and Interventional Spine Musculoskeletal Medicine. Today, Dr. Shannon Schultz is going to discuss low back pain injuries and new treatment modalities in the workplace. Dr. Schultz completed an advanced care interventional spine and sports medicine fellowship program at OSS Health and joined the provider team in September of 2019. Dr. Schultz has special interest in interventional spine procedures, spinal cord stimulation, diagnostic ultrasound and ultrasound guide and injections. She also has an interest in musculoskeletal medicine, sports medicine, and electrodiagnostic studies. Before we begin, I will read the following disclosure. Once we get the disclosure to come up there. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of this educational activity are required to disclose all relevant financial relationships in any amount occurring within the past 12 months related both to content and commercial supporters of the activity. The planning committee and presenters do not have any relevant financial relationship with any commercial interest. Training and food was provided by Abbott DRG Simulator, SimWave Peripheral Nerve Simulator within the past 12 months. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Shannon Schultz. Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today and taking time out of your busy days to um, be with us. I will be going over lumbar spine injuries, low back injuries, specifically as it relates to the workplace and then new treatment modalities that we kind of have to offer here. Um, so some objectives today are really to identify acute versus chronic lumbar injuries based off of imaging, highlight some different pain generators in the lumbar spine, recognize various treatment modalities depending on the type of injury, and then take a look at those new treatment options that we have to offer. So focusing on the low back. Now, low back pain is the leading cause of disability worldwide. It is the most common reason for missed work. It's the second most common for physician visits. Now, before we get into the reasons of low back pain, we really need to get a closer look at the anatomy of the low back. So anatomy is composed of, let me make sure you guys can see my mouse, which you can, perfect. The anatomy is composed of these squares here. These squares are your vertebrae or the bony parts of the spine. In between, we have the disc. Now the disc is a shock absorber to the spine, but over time, it's kind of like a jelly donut. It'll squish down, that outer rim can break open, the inside can come out. That's what we call a bulging disc. And that bulging disc can affect the surrounding nerves. The nerves here are highlighted in yellow. You see them coming out of little holes on each side. Those holes are called foramen. And then we also have ligaments in the spine here connecting the um, vertebrae together. 
And there's lots of muscles in the surrounding um, tissues that we cannot see on this image. So some of the causes. So when we're talking about low back pain, we just talked about the anatomy. Now, how does that anatomy correlate to pain? Now I've listed these in reference to work injuries. So the most common starting at the top, the least common at the bottom in relates to work injuries. So a lumbar sprain or strain is gonna be your most common injury that we're gonna see with work injuries. Someone either overexerted themselves, lifted something too heavy, et cetera. Second most common thing we see is a, a disc disruption. So what that can mean is two different things. If we look at the schematic over here, it could be this little tear, remember that jelly donut? So just a tear in the outer rim. This is called a fissure. This is something that can happen acutely after an, a work injury, or that outer rim can actually break open and here that jelly can come out. And as you see this jelly come out, what is it doing? It's pressing on a surrounding nerve and that causes the symptoms shooting down the leg. Another area for pain in the low back can be the joints themselves. Now the joints are located right here in the lower aspect of the spine. It's where two bones meet together. Now joints can have issues after any sort of a fall or jolting. Um, and that's noticed that's um, easily identified by edema within the bone or within the joint itself. Sometimes it manifests as a cyst if there's enough fluid. Spinal stenosis is something that we'll go into in a little bit more depth later. In and of itself, spinal stenosis is not from a work-related injury. It is a degenerative process in the spine, but it absolutely can be accentuated or amplified by say a new disc herniation it can result in worsening stenosis. Arthritis again is more a degener degenerative process. And that happens again within these facet joints down here. But even if you have arthritis, someone has a hard fall, this can definitely become inflamed on top of the degeneration that's already there. A really hard fall would result in instability or a vertebral body fracture. Those are really rarely seen. So we'll kind of, we'll kind of focus more on the discs and the facet joints here. Um, and I'd be remiss if I did not touch a little bit on some other causes of quote unquote low back pain. Someone may say, oh, it's in my low back, but it may actually be within their hip joint themselves. Hip arthritis, we usually see right here within the uh, femoral acetabular joint right here. Sometimes it's trochanteric bursitis or gluteal tendonitis, which is right out here. The SI joint is a very large joint here in between the sacrum and the ilium, or it could be a true sciatica, which is actually where the sciatic nerve itself gets pinched between the piriformis. So actually the, the term sciatica is usually misused um, because this true sciatica is actually very rare. We barely ever see this. Um, so one of the first things that we do when a patient comes to our office is we get some historical information. So if this is a work injury, when did it happen? How did it happen? Who have you seen before you come to us? Um, typically as an orthopedic provider, they're seeing either their um, primary care provider or workers' compensation um, physician first prior to being referred over to us. Um, so we want to make sure that we get a good history. We also want to make sure that do they have any other pain in the same distribution from a prior injury? If so, what is their baseline level of pain? Um, are there any aggravating or alleviating activities? And then on the right side, we're really going to focus on bowel or bladder symptoms, fever, sweat, weight changes, or weakness. These are really our red flag symptoms. If there is something going on within those three bullet points, they need a little bit more of an urgent workup. So always make sure we do a focused physical exam. Really focused, so say they come in with low back pain, we're looking mainly at the strength in their legs, mainly looking at the sensation in their legs as well as reflexes at the patella and the Achilles. Now we're gonna look at extension and flexion of the back itself and palpate the low back, but a lot of our, our exam is focused on the legs. And then with neck pain, same thing, we're focused a lot on the upper extremities. So we do utilize quite a few diagnostic studies. MRI is our test of choice. We will choose a CT scan if someone cannot have an MRI for say cardiac defibrillator um, or other reasons of, of metal retaining objects within their body. Um, electrodiagnostics are utilized if there is pain going in a specific distribution of a single nerve. 
that can come sometimes mimic spine pain. So say if they have pain going from their elbow down to their hand, but not necessarily neck pain, we may be looking at more of a peripheral nerve entrapment. And then we will utilize blood tests for those people that I just had that red circle around. So those people that have fevers, chills, um, overt weakness, something else that, that might be going on such as an infection. So how do we identify new injuries on imaging? So I'll show you some examples of some MRIs in a little bit, but some of the big, big key features to focus on is in there, are there any swelling in the soft tissues? Edema within the bone itself, especially around that facet joint. Are there any new fractures within the joint or within the vertebral body itself? Any instability, and really that's where, um, that would be a much larger injury than we typically see in a work injury, so that's pretty uncommon. One of the most common things we see are a new disc herniation with nerve compression. And it's actually quite nice if they do have um, old imaging that we can do a compare and contrast because that way we can see, is there a worsening disc herniation that's now compressing new nerves or worsening stenosis? So before we move on to some of the fun stuff that we do, we always wanna make sure that we maximize our conservative care. That always is gonna start with therapy, whether that's PT, OT, acupuncture, chiropractic, massage, et cetera. Um, lots of different modalities from heat and cold, traction table, inversion table, things like that. Medications, there's a whole list of things. Um, just so you know, we do not have anyone here that's licensed in CBD or THC administration. Um, and obviously the goals of conservative care are kind of the same throughout. Can we relieve the pain and can we actually improve function? And this may not be necessarily full pain relief, but can we at least get them back into work in a safe manner? Um, and with the ability to tolerate their job better. So some initial interventional treatment options. This is really just a list of them. I will go through um, each one of these in a little bit more detail. I'm gonna start off by um, some of the joints that are the mimickers of the spine because these are much easier to treat. We can do an injection in the office and if that's all it takes, then fantastic. Um, so this can be joint pain, this can be bursa pain, um, or ligament pain, someone who's not really responding to anti-inflammatories, therapy, all of that conservative care, and they're really not a surgical candidate or they don't want surgery. Um, an ultrasound guided injection is really the best route, especially when we're talking about low back mimickers. This is an example of a hip injection. You can see it here under ultrasound, this is the femoral head, and here's the neck, here's the needle coming in, and here's a cartoon depiction on the right side. Now for injections of other body parts, say the knee, we do use a gel substance called visco supplementation. That sometimes is a little bit more effective than the steroid injections. And then PRPs can be, PRP can be utilized within the joints, ligaments, bones, um, with significantly better improvement, especially in our younger patient population who does not necessarily want to proceed with surgery. So let's get into a few of the patient presentations here. So in the neck, it's essentially gonna mimic the low back. So this is going to be someone who has low back pain radiating down the lower extremities. Um, that can involve the hip, the knee, the foot. And then same thing in the neck. So neck pain radiating down the upper extremity to the shoulder, the elbow and hand. And just to keep in mind, someone with a pinched nerve in the back doesn't necessarily have to have back pain. Maybe they only present with leg pain. Maybe they only present with calf pain or foot pain. Um, so that physical exam that we do initially is really important to kind of differentiating the pain generator. So what do we do for a patient who comes in with this? Um, if it's confirmed on, on an MRI that they have a new disc herniation in the specific region that's causing this pain, we can offer an epidural steroid injection. Now there are two different types of epidural steroid injections, interlaminar and transforaminal. Interlaminar injections are offered when people have um, bilateral pain, where it's not really in a specific distribution. That way the interlaminar injection comes here right into the center and the medication coats both sides and it spans multiple levels. A transforaminal injection, this one, comes in right from the side, right where that little nerve root is exiting. So this is for someone who has a very clear MRI of a pinched nerve and that is correlating perfectly with their pain. So that way we can really target the specific nerve that's being irritated. Moving on to your next patient. So if someone comes in after a fall at work, just back pain or just neck pain, this is almost always a strain or a sprain. 
Now, if someone is not improving with all of those conservative measures we already talked about, we get an MRI, we take a closer look, and maybe it's those facet joints that have some fluid around them um, that have kind of shifted after a fall. They're kind of edematous. They have uh, fluid within the joint themselves. We can uh, do a procedure with the actual facet joint. So the facet joint here, it's the, the intersection between these two bones. So this is what a normal facet joint looks like. And this is the same area where you can get arthritis. So this is what an arthritic facet joint looks like over here. Now, in some of our younger patients, it may look like this. Some of our older patients, it may look like this. We have patients from all ages who do work and do have work injuries. Um, in our younger patients, we would opt for what's called an intraarticular injection. And that would be an injection of steroid directly into the joint itself and see if we could get them some good long-term pain relief. And our patients who are a little bit older and it's really kind of a flare up of their pre-existing arthritis, the best thing would be to do a medial branch block. Now what that is, is it's actually a test and it's a test to see if we could take away their pain. So it's, um, it's kind of a three-step process. We do two tests to see if we're going after the right joints. And if we have really good results from those two tests, then we move forward with a neurotomy or an ablation. And what that is, it's done the same exact way, but the very tip of the needle heats up. Now these nerves are only, um, their only focus is to cause pain. So it's okay that we ablate these. And I'll just give you an example of what that looks like when we're doing them in the procedure. So the reason that we do these tests sometimes, I would look at all of these little red dots throughout this schematic. All of these little red dots are exactly where those nerves are located. So there's literally everyone at every single segment in the low back. So that's why sometimes we do the test to make sure that we're going up to the right level. Once it's confirmed, then we do the procedure. This is what it looks like for both the blocks and for the burning of the nerves. Like I said, for the burning of the nerves, just the very tip of the needle heats up and burns the nerve as it passes here. And the same thing can be done also in the neck. So in the neck, here are the same exact nerves. Again, there's one at each segment. And we do the same process. We can test them out first. And once we're, we guarantee that we're in the right spot, give them some good pain relief. Here's the injection themselves and same thing. The ablation, it's just the very tip of the needle heats up and burns that nerve. And that gives, by the way, long lasting pain relief at least a year, if not significantly longer. Um, another patient presentation, either a fall onto um, their buttock or maybe it was more of a twisting injury. So someone who has deep buttock pain, maybe some radiation down the lateral thigh or posterior thigh, but rarely does it ever go past the knee. We're really focusing on um, some SI joint pain. SI joint, like I said, is the large joint in between the sacrum. So your sacrum's right over here and the ilium. Ilium is that huge bone that's attached to your hip joint. This is an example of an SI joint injection with really good flow throughout the joint here. Um, another really good um, option for SI joint pain is essentially doing physical therapy. Um, that really helps with SI joint stability. Some advanced interventional treatment options. So these are some of the new things that we're gonna be talking about um, that we're gonna be able to offer some of our patients. We'll, I'll go into each one of these in detail here. So our first patient here, fell down a lot of stairs at work. This has to be a really high impact injury, especially in a younger patient that would result in a compression fracture deformity. Now, if you have some older people at work who may or may not fall down some stairs, this may be a little bit easier to happen because these compression fractures are usually associated with people who, who have bone low, low bone mineral density to begin with. Um, but to show you an example, this is what a normal vertebral body looks like. And here's what it looks like after a compression fracture. Now there's one of two arms that you can utilize for treatment. One arm is conservative care. So just like a fracture in any other part of the body, it'll heal on its own in about four to six weeks time. But it is quite painful. So the question is, is can they get through it with pain medication um, and some relative rest? The second treatment arm is someone who's just having excruciating pain, medication isn't taking care of it, and they really can't live their daily life definitely cannot work, that option would be what's called a vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. Now this is what happens during a kyphoplasty. A small um, probe is inserted into the vertebral body that has a little balloon on it. That balloon is filled up with air or saline, excuse me. That balloon is then removed and there's a nice big void there and that void is filled up with cement. Cement gives really instantaneous relief of this pain 
but it also gives some good height restoration as well. And you could see that here. So here's a, a new vertebral body fracture. And you can see by the wedging, the different shape of the vertebral body. So this one has a nice square shape to it. And this one is wedged. This one right above it, this is T12. This one was wedged even further because this is actually an old compression fracture. Now, if these compression fractures are um, delayed in their treatment options, especially after four to six weeks, the ability to restore height is really minimized. Then you can see that by looking at the right-sided picture. This is T12 with the cement in it. Didn't gain much height, gained a little bit, but not a ton, not nearly as much as L1 did. Have some height restoration and immediate pain relief after this procedure. And here's another schematic showing the pre-op um, vertebral body fracture and then this with the cement in it. It's almost exactly the same height as before. That's what we aim for at least. Um, so this is another patient presentation. So someone who has an injury at work, we've tried everything um, as far as epidurals, um, medial branch blocks, facet injections, things like that. But they just have pain, numbness, tingling, heaviness in their legs, much, much worse when they're standing walking, really improved, almost non-existent when they're sitting. And this is really uh, typical of what we call spinal stenosis. So as you can see on the left, standing and walking, a ton of pain. And we call this a shopping cart sign because this is the people that you see in the grocery store who need a shopping cart because they lean forward and they feel much better. Um, whereas sitting also significantly improves their symptoms. Um, and the etiology behind this is sometimes it's congenital, so sometimes they're born with a smaller uh, spinal canal, but other times it's acquired. So this is something that does happen over time, but there can be a mechanical compression to it, such as in a work injury, that can accelerate these changes significantly. So the grading for lumbar spinal stenosis is really important, and it really helps to look at the schematic on the right side. So a normal looking spine, here we have your spinal column, and this is your spinal cord right in the center. Look how nice and wide open that is. When we look at the grade one, the mild spinal stenosis, we have some narrowing there of that central canal. Grade two, moderate stenosis, again, a little bit more narrowing of the central canal. And then grade three, the severe stenosis, really hard to even see where the spinal cord is. And this results in some really significant pain. Grade three, severe spinal cord stenosis, these people are ones that need to be referred to surgery. However, there's something that we can offer in these mild to moderate cases, because even in mild to moderate, this causes significant disability. People are not able to stand or walk, so working is quite difficult unless it's a full sit-down job. This is another uh, schematic showing spinal stenosis. We mainly focused here on central stenosis, but it, it can also be narrowed here in the lateral recess or all the way out here in the foramen. Here's an example of what it looks like on an MRI. So here is a disc bulge. This is a new disc bulge in the patient who already has some spinal stenosis. So this is when they're sitting. Right here in the center of the spinal canal, you'll see the spinal cord. It kind of tethers down almost like a horse's tail and tapers off right about here. But we want as much space here in, in this area. And that indicates that there's no pain associated with this area, but look how tight it gets here. Now when that same person flexes forward, look how much it opens. That same person extends backwards, look how much that compresses that spinal cord. You can see the curling up of all of these nerve roots here. So what used to be the treatment algorithm here? Um, same thing with doing all of your conservative care, trying your spinal injections, plus or minus the opioid if the person did really, absolutely did not want to have surgery because it's quite a large surgery. It's a decompression laminectomy surgery. Um, so that used to be the only option. Recently, within the past few years here, we do have an interspinous spacer device that we can now utilize as an interim, see if we could get them pain relief before ever having to undergo a massive decompression surgery. So what is this interspinous spacer device? So it's a small FDA approved extension blocker. Um, it's a titanium implant. It treats up to two levels at the same time. The device that's available in the US is called Superion has really excellent, excellent level one evidence at about five years. This is an example of what it looks like on an X-ray right here. This is your AP view, kind of rests amongst the um, spinous processes above and below, and that's how it's wedged in there. And this is what it looks like on the lateral view. So what are some of the advantages? 
this can be placed really from a minimally invasive standpoint. The um, incision is very small um, and the recovery is almost immediate. People, as soon as they get up after this procedure, they stand up, they say, oh my God, I have no pain when I'm standing. So um, the good thing about this is, is it, doesn't never, it never precludes people from having surgery if they need to have it. Um, the post-op complications are very minimal, if anything. The most common one is having a fracture here of the spinous process. That's most commonly seen in people with osteoporosis, which is why in osteoporosis, osteoporotic patients, it is not recommended. That's an exclusion criteria. Um, however, if a spinous process does fracture, we treat it just as you would a regular fracture anywhere else in the body. It's regular, relatively conservative management. So here's some of the criteria, having that spinal stenosis that has not been alleviated with any of the other modalities. And people with spinal stenosis, about 50% of them do well with an epidural, at least for a short period of time. But that other 50%, this is at least something that we can offer them. Um, we could do one or two levels of mild to moderate stenosis. They do need a spinous process for anatomy. So if they've had prior surgery at that level, they are not the candidate for this. And again, this is a case by case basis. So not everyone's the candidate for the decompression device. Some of the exclusions, like I said, if they've had prior uh, surgery or decompression at that level, L5 and S1 is excluded mainly because there is no lamina um, for it to be attached to at the S1 level. Anyone with really significant scoliosis or some that only has back pain or pain literally in any position, this is really gonna work best for people who have pain when they're standing walking, no pain when they're sitting. Here's an example of what it looks like. This is the device being deployed. Here's after full deployment in the lateral position. And here's what it looks like in the AP. So here it's wrapped up and round, go through the spinous processes. And at five years, I mean, you're seeing 50% or more functional and pain improvement. And like I said, it's really instantaneous. Most people feel fantastic immediately afterwards. Um, and really the only post-operative instructions are taking the, an anti-inflammatory such as Tylenol or leave and wearing a back brace for the first two weeks. Um, another patient presentation here. So this is a patient who has back pain only after an injury. Um, they may have something going down the leg, but it's really not overly bothersome, has not been responsive with all the stuff that we already mentioned. They might be an option for one of two things, the spinal cord stimulator, which I'll go into in a little bit more detail later, or a new procedure called the basal retrieval nerve radiofrequency ablation. Now, what is the basal retrieval nerve? I have yet to talk about that. So a little bit of anatomy behind that. Basal retrieval nerve is the nerve that enters the vertebral body itself and it supplies the end plates here that surround the disc with nutrients. Now there's a theory that after a disc bulge happens, so say after a work injury, there's a new disc bulge, it could cause some disruption in the end plate and hence um, damage that basal vertebral nerve. Um, but there is also a little bit of a, what came first, chicken or the egg? Is it a disruption in the end plate that causes the disc bulge or vice versa? Um, but regardless, the basal retrieval nerve is kind of the pain generator there that we know for sure. And what happens to the end plate? So the way that we can see if the basal retrieval nerve is implicated in these issues is if there's a disc bulge, like we see here on this MRI, little disc bulge here, but then look at the end plate surrounding it. So it's bright white here, right? Almost looks like swelling within the bone when you compare it to all the other levels. This is nice and smooth, nice and smooth. So this is really showing us there's an acute disc bulge that has caused an acute change in the bony structure around it. Um, and this is called a type one, which means that it's acute or it's new. Type one is identified being, being bright on our T2 image and then being dark over here. And this is as opposed to type two modic changes, which is really bright on both. Type two modic changes are seen more in a chronic injury. Um, so how are modic changes really related to low back pain? So this is really uncommonly, if ever seen near a normal disc. And type one changes are really associated with a new disc bulge. Type two chronic changes and type three have been there for a long time, so long that the type three changes are actually sclerotic. Our bone has scarred it down. Um, now this, the increasing incidence is increased with age. So this will be in a few of our older patients but I have definitely seen it in younger individuals as well, most commonly at the two lowest levels in our spine. 
L45 and L5S1. So in 60% of patients with low back pain, there are modic changes. And then low back pain is more commonly associated with that type one change. Patients can actually shift between the modic types or they can completely resolve on their own. And again, there's a really strong correlation between a new disc herniation and type one changes. So what's, what do we have to offer them? So it's called a basovertebral nerve ablation. Um, and this is mainly used for people, again, with that low back pain, without radiation. We need to see those m changes on MRI, and they have not been responsive to all other options. So what's done here is a small probe is inserted into the vertebral body, kind of similar to that cement procedure I talked about earlier. But the probe is then uh, advanced right to the very center, right where at the root of the basovertebral nerve. And then a small probe is advanced right on top of it. And then it generates a field of um, ablative techniques, um, approximately one centimeter in diameter, and we burn for approximately 15 minutes. Now to see what that looks like on an MRI postoperatively, you see this nice ablation here right in the center and the center on both sides. Um, now the outcomes with this have been really fantastic. So over 600 procedures have been performed in the US, and this is as of 2018, so I'm sure there have been many more since then. Um, and OSS Health is the only practice performing this in Pennsylvania. It is FDA cleared, minimally invasive. It's an outpatient procedure, again, a very small incision. <clears throat> and at five year, the, the durability of this is about 50, 80, 50 to 80% improvement in pain and functionality. And our very last patient presentation, so pain is unrelieved with all of the above. This can be pain that may follow a very specific dermatome, meaning that it goes just down the side of the leg, or maybe it's only in the back, maybe it's only in the foot, et cetera. So one option would be spinal cord stimulation. Now spinal cord stimulation operates as an electrical signal that's um, pulsed in a high frequency so that patients cannot feel it. And um, it blocks the pain signals going to the brain. So we're not technically fixing anything, but we're blocking their pain. Um, now this doesn't mean that they're not gonna feel if they stub their toe, this is really just gonna block their um, neurogenic pain. Um, traditional spinal cord stimulation is utilized with one or two leads right in the center of the epidural space. With all of stimulation that I'm gonna talk about, this, this one as well as the next two, you do have a trial period. So the patient is able to test if they like their spinal cord stimulator um, for about seven to 10 days. And this one's a little bit more specific. This is called a dorsal root ganglion, ganglion stimulator. So this is for those patients who mainly just have a disc bulge here at L4-5 and then here at L5-S1, that's really pinching on the L4 and the L5 nerve root. Maybe they have nothing else going on in their low back and their, <coughs> excuse me, in their neck or in their leg elsewhere. So that way we can really target these specific nerves. And with this stimulator, it's kind of a set it and forget it. It's not, it's a non-rechargeable stimulator. Um, patient gets really good pain relief with these because we could get them so close to the nerves that are affected. Peripheral nerve stimulation. So this is if someone has say hip joint pain, they don't wanna undergo um, a hip replacement at this time or maybe it's um, pain elsewhere throughout the body, just in a really peripheral distribution. So of their ankle or of their knee, we're able to offer this peripheral nerve stimulator. So it's just a wire that's implanted under the skin and then they wear the battery on the outside. So in this depiction, it shows that the battery is um, kind of secured with an adhesive device, but there's also another system where it's secured with like a band or um, uh, any type of pull-on wearable. And just keep in mind that for all of these procedures, they're all reserved for appropriate patients. The goal is to get them back to work safely and appropriately, um, decrease pain, increase function. And as always, we coordinate with our rehabilitation team as well. So never let pain steal your passion. And we will start with some questions here. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Snyder. Hi. So Nobody wrote any questions on the Q&A while we were going. I'm assuming you guys are holding them for the end, which is very polite of you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions that they want to either type into the Q&A or send a quick message over to, uh, to me inside, uh, inside of Zoom? I'll give you guys a second to type them out. There we go. 
Will the recording be available for later? The answer to that is yes. Yeah, so in order to that, you need to email Melissa. And that's so Dr. Schultz has just put up. So if you email Melissa, you can get the recording of the entire presentation. Absolutely. For failed low back surgery. So the question for Dr. Schultz is, what would you suggest for people that have already had surgery, but they find that they're not getting relief? For failed low back surgery, um, one of the most beneficial interventions is doing the traditional spinal cord stimulation um, that can be placed safely in people who have had prior surgery and usually offers really amazing coverage. There are two different types of um, stimulators that we can place. There's one that's rechargeable, one that's non-rechargeable, and that's really up to the patients. Um, I usually ask them if they're able to always have their phone on them and recharge it. And if they're able to do that and they like to do that every night, um, I, I would usually recommend the rechargeable option just because it, the battery has to be changed less frequently. Any other questions? I'm not seeing many. Uh, last chance for anybody that like to ask a question. I mean, you can always email them later if you if uh, you just can't think of it now, which is I know often the case. Uh, before we go, people that are looking for CME credit, in order to receive that CME credit, uh, please follow uh, these directions. So you want to uh, email Melissa, and then you'll get your forms from there, and then you send the completed forms back to her. And then she'll send you the certificate uh, once once all of that is completed. So if that CME credit, just email Melissa. So as we conclude, uh, be on the lookout for more information regarding our next webinar. That's going to take place in 2021. And uh, if you do think of questions later, don't hesitate to send us uh, send us an email. And uh, please come by. Take care.